So Mr. Wade has decided, he's heard that uh, Moby Dick in, in, in Glenelg Country School is so um, thoroughly treated that he, and he's also heard about period three, three. period three, night, a class of 2018, <laughs> um, that he's, look at he's doing, he's actually a, Right, uh, <laughs> that you guys are going to be featured on a um, documentary. Ooh. Yes, uh, it's, about, it's about the ways of a 17-year-old. All right, I, I think we need to just jump in, okay? Okay, so let's begin. Um, I can't tell you how, how excited, can you, can you close the door for us? Excited I am for today just because... Um, this is a big part of the year, right? Uh, we're going to be working on Moby Dick from now until spring break, probably, okay? And um, you should have your notebooks open right this instant, right? I don't know what in the world, where we are, right? Uh, so have your notebooks out and put on there, day one, Moby Dick, right? Um, this is a very lucky, this is a very uh, fortunate time for you guys. Um, you have no idea what you're about to encounter. I'm assuming none of you guys have read Moby Dick before fully. Maybe you know the story a little bit because you've seen the musical. Uh, maybe you watched uh, Into the Heart of the Sea, so you think you know a little bit about it. But there's nothing like reading it. And frankly, um, I'll just say this. Um, this is our like long dive, if you will, into uh, a, a extended work. You know, I, as I said yesterday, Melville is an anti-transcendentalist. He's going to, in a large uh, sense, be responding to a lot of the ideas of Emerson and, and uh, Hawthorne. You'll see over and over again. That's, uh, not, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, Emerson and Thoreau, okay? Um, and uh, this is, a lot of times what I notice, as I've taught this for many years, almost 20 years, this book, is that this is a real turning point in a lot of students' just careers, in the sense that, like, this is oftentimes the first time they've really come face to face with a work of real genius. This is, um, I, I read this book every single year and I'm never uh, not amazed by it, right? It, we've, we, you've read a lot of brilliant things before, a lot of smart things, a lot of interesting things, but this is really the product of genius. Um, it's sort of like one of those rare uh, birds that you get to encounter once in your life. And um, Frankly, I think this is a rarity even for the author himself. This is, is his is his magnum opus, and um, you know I, I studied this in grad school, and I you know I, uh, we had four meetings on it. I, I've had old students who've studied in college, and they've had uh, you know like a week on it, and they've read s several uh, chapters or something like that. But you guys are going to be able to do something that you know you don't get to do very often, which is to read it for weeks on end and really get steeped in the novel. So I encourage you to really do the work. So first point I want to make is um, this work of genius is only available to you in one way, and that is to read it, right? Right now, let me, let's make it clear. Do not read any other aids. No schmoop, no uh, cliff notes. Those are verboten, okay? That's, to me, now that's cheating. Don't say to yourself like, well, I didn't get it. That's the point. You got to wrestle with this text, okay? You follow me? So those are gone out of the way, but you got to do the work. You got to give yourself the time. And I'm telling you right now, if you put in the time, you will not regret it. You will be um, delighted and you'll learn interesting things. This is a great book because a lot of the stuff we've been reading all year long is going to coalesce here from the Puritans to the Enlightenment. It's all in here. This book has architecture, art, biology, history, religion, philosophy. It's a, a whole potpourri of uh, disciplines, and whatever you're interested in, it's in here. Um, it's also a very funny book, and it's a, a very deep book. I've had students year after year, you know, make paintings. I'll bring artwork in here as the as the you know unit goes by. But like, I've had students write symphonies, um, songs, um, poems, paintings, sculpture, mobiles, innumerable kinds of things because it's so inspiring. Okay, so. Um, be inspired, you know, let yourself be inspired, but the only way it's going to work is if you do the work. You with me? Can I get an amen? amen. All right, you got to be there. Okay, so that's the first thing. All right, um, what I want to do is I want to talk about um, something to get started. What time does this class go to? Does anybody remember? Huh? 10.01? All right, we got we to gotta really fly here. Um, so I want to talk a little, do a little intro talk about Moby Dick, um, the book, and... Um, 
so a couple other things. So you should take some notes here, okay? Again, don't just write only what I put on the board because I'm going to say a lot of things, okay? So I want to talk about first something that's called um, composition history. And that means like the, you know, the story behind the book's writing, okay? And I'm also going to talk some about called reception history. So you should get this down. Reception history and composition. Reception history is the story about how the public received the novel. This is kind of important, okay? So the first thing I guess I'd like you to know is that um, Herman Melville was one of the America's first uh, literary rock stars. Um, just wait for it, wait for it. So as a young man, he went off to sea, just like somebody else we know. Who's that? Right. He actually got a, a ship from New Bedford um, when he was a young man. Uh, he was, I think he was 23, maybe. And uh, he went off in a ship to go whaling. Um, he, had, he, he himself was a whaleman. So you are going to read a book about whaling from a guy who knows it from the source. Okay, that's the first thing. Um, now, he had a very interesting experience. And this is all part of the writing of Moby Dick. He um, had a very uh, unpleasant captain. Um, in, on his ship, it was a, he was, I guess he was a real hard driver. And you remember that in chapter one where he's talking about being ordered around like that? Well, apparently his captain was really kind of a vicious character. So much so that when he, uh, the, their ship arrived in the French Polynesian Islands, um, he and a buddy of his decided that they wanted to jump ship, which means they wanted to basically get off and not come back. So they got, and, and you know, just hope for a better way home because they wanted to have, have nothing to do with the ship anymore. So he actually snuck off into the woods with his friend, waited for the ship to leave, and he um, was just going to wait around until some other ship could pick him up. Okay? This was a, a place where whalemen stopped every now and then. Well, guess what? It turned out that this island was full of two tribes, two tribes, aboriginal tribes. One was a friendly tribe. The other, the, called the Taipees, were cannibals. This is a true story, right? I'm telling you right now. And so they, want, they thought they were going to the, this one tribe. But they wandered through the jungle, and guess what? It turns out they, they ended up at the cannibal camp. And he and his friend ended up staying with them for a number of months. Long story short, he gets home, and he writes a novel about it called Taipei. So that's the first thing you should make note of. Uh, Herman Melville's first novel is called Taipei. And, you know, it's a... It's a Loosely based on his life, uh, very, it's a very fun novel, it's very interesting, it's very exotic. When he gets back home, he writes this novel, and it is an instant success. People are fascinated by it. He's a young author, and the books are flying off the shelves. He does very well. He has a follow-up novel about the same experience going home on a different island called Omu. This is an equally kind of fun, adventurous, interesting novel. Again, he, his uh, star is rising, and he is a... Uh, uh, become a young, successful writer. Now, here's the problem. Right after that, he then starts writing uh, like more artistic novels, uh, things that are more kind of literary. And he comes out with two or three novels after this, which I won't really go into, but the point is they're flops, okay? They're financial failures, okay? And by this time, he has a family, he's got to support them, and he's thinking to himself like, oh man, I need to get back on the horse. So he decides what he's going to do is try to recapture some of the success of these old days. And he's going to write about a story he heard when he was in the Polynesian Islands, which had to do with this whale called Mocha Dick, who was kind of spotted, white, brown whale, who was kind of vicious. And he had also heard about this other story about a whale that destroyed a ship called the Essex, which is what the film is about. And he kind of was going to conglomerate these and make what's called a sea romance. Now, what is a... What is a um, so, the point you should see is Moby Dick was originally just going to be a sea romance. What does the word romance mean in this context? We've gone over this before. No, no. A romance. I made you look it up one time. It, who said that? Cedric. An adventure story, okay? It was just going to be a sea adventure story kind of um, like these novels, and he was just going to like try to sell some books. Are you following me? Now, he's writing in western Massachusetts, where his home is, and uh, he was... Um, you know, spending his time working on this novel. And guess who then comes into his life? Very close. Closer. Nathaniel Hawthorne. He meets Nathaniel Hawthorne. 
And they have the, the encounter between Herman Melville, the young Herman Melville, and the very well-regarded, experienced Nathaniel Hawthorne is one of the like big moments in American literary history. Um, they have this intense, there's this like story about them walking up on this mountain and there's a terrible storm and they get into this little cave and they have these long talks and um, you know Hawthorne brings out the kind of philosopher in um, an artist in Melville and at that moment Melville decides like forget it I'm not gonna write a sea romance anymore I'm gonna do what I originally intended to do was write some great work okay I'm not gonna just try to please the masses I am going to do what I intended to do. And the book was, I guess, nearly finished at that point, and then it doubled in length after his meeting with Hawthorne. It doubled in length. I think the basic plot stays the same, but what you'll see is this, all this other stuff in the novel, which makes it um, richer and more complex and more philosophical, more artistic. Now, that being said, I'll just uh, point out something. This is kind of like a really important idea. You see, you see this little note here It says, two readers. This is something that's going to be important for you guys all along the time that we read this novel. So what he kind of learned from this experience with the successes and failures of his novels is that there's basically two kinds of readers. There is uh, what he called, these are, we, we know a lot about what he was thinking about writing this novel because he, he and Hawthorne ex corresponded a lot. They wrote letters back and forth while he was writing the novel. He said there's the superficial page turner, okay, SPT for short. Um, and that guy, what, is this, what do you suppose the superficial page turn is looking for in a novel? Yeah, adventure, color, you know, just superficial stuff, right? Things that just like delight the eye and just entertain you, right? So, but you have to write for those people, why? Yeah, you got to make some money, right? We're here to sell some books. But if you're a great artist and a great author, there's another audience you want to read. And he called those the eagle-eyed reader. The eagle-eyed reader is the one who can kind of see beneath the surface and look to something more, more important, more profound. And what you'll see in this novel is that he is going to kind of simultaneously hit both readers. The superficial page turner. So like, for instance, last night, if you didn't laugh last night while you read, you should leave the room. You have no business being here, right? The, 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 uh, the jumping into bed of this colorful cannibal and the frightened Ishmael is one a hilarious scene, I think. Uh, and it, see, there you go, like, uh, and if you didn't see the humor in it, either you didn't read it very well or I don't, there's something wrong with you, you should check your pulse, right? And that, I think, is one of those moments where, like, just anybody who's just looking for a good time would really enjoy the novel, right? But even in that one scene, there are some profound things that are said, and oftentimes, you should write this, down right now I'm about to say because Melville understood that sometimes the superficial page turner might become easily offended maybe or doesn't really want to think too deeply the deeper things will be said in a jocular joking manner sometimes that you maybe aren't really it doesn't seem like you're being encouraged to take very seriously but in fact maybe Melville is interested in mostly in that sort of thing so you have to read carefully are you following me sometimes they'll say things just lightly or as a little aside, you know, what I mean? you know what an aside is? Like in, in theater, you know, like when someone says something to someone over here, or maybe to the audience, that's called an aside. Sometimes Ishmael will do that, he'll, he'll say things kind of in an aside, or as a tangent. Anybody read chapter two last night? I mean, that's what I like to hear. Chapter two, very good, is very strange. A lot of curious things are said there. And at the end of chapter two, he says, well, enough of this blubbering. Implying what about everything he said? Well, just tell me, what does he mean? Like, oh, enough of this blubbering. Let's go inside and see what the spouter in is like. What's he basically saying about everything he's just said? It's not important. It's not important. But that's when you should be putting your lights on. It's like, oh, wait a minute. This is maybe one of those moments where he's acting like things aren't important, but in fact is something really important. So you got to be tuned into that. So a big point for today as our intro is, be aware of this idea that there are two readers, okay? You guys read some Shakespeare last year, didn't you? Yeah. I mean, this is pretty famous for Shakespeare as well, for maybe different reasons, because he was trying to sell tickets. So you guys may remember uh, reading about, like, who st sits down low at the theaters? In, yeah, they have a certain name in uh, Shakespeare's time. They're called the groundlings. You ever heard of that or no? So the groundlings, they get the cheap seats, and they want 
easy laughs. Are you following me? So a lot of Shakespeare has like some kind of body, silly humor in it. And those people are yucking it up down below because that's all they can kind of understand, right? There's the simple people. And then, of course, there's the well-read, educated types who get the good seats. And they're interested in artistry, poetry, are you with me? Um, deep thoughts. And he appeals to them as well. So you can see a little parallel in this kind of operation of hitting two kinds of readers at once. But hopefully, you're not just going to be the old SPT, but instead the eagle-eyed reader. Amen? Amen. All right. So, uh, you know, this being said, the last thing I'll say just by, by way of intro is, um, and this has to do with, as I said, reception history. Um, do you understand what reception history is or not? Okay, reception history of a book is the story of how the public uh, embraced it. Okay, you with me? And the thing you should know is that Moby Dick was a flop. It was um, completely uh, pilloried or critiqued or criticized. Um, it, it bewildered people. It confused people. It was called unnovelish. Um, the... The critics thought it was like a real failure on his part. And really, after Moby Dick, um, Melville um, kind of backs off from this kind of uh, work. And really, his career just peters out. You know, he was only a novelist for 10 years out of his life. And he lived till I think he was 80 or something like that. And you know, here's a terrible thing. We, you all have heard of Moby Dick, right? Everyone knows about Moby Dick. But when Herman Melville died, his, ep his, uh, his obituary read, today Herman Melville ri died, author of Type P. I mean, isn't that extraordinary? Like when he died, people didn't even think of Moby Dick as an important novel at all, right? They, um, I'm going to read you a couple quotes just because I think they're kind of nifty. Here's something, a contemporary uh, criticism of it. It says, this is an ill-compounded mixture of romance and matter of fact. The idea of a connected and collective story has obviously visited and abandoned its writer again and again in the course of the composition. The style of his tale is in places disfigured by mad and rather bad English. It's a catastrophe. It's hastily, weakly, and obscurely managed. Another guy says, We have little more to say in reprobation or in recommendation of this absurd book. So much trash belonging to the worst school of bedlam literature. Bedlam is like a madhouse. Are you with me? It's crazy. Last one, he says, thrice unlucky Herman Melville. This is an odd book professing to be a novel, wantonly eccentric, outrageously bombastic, and, and so on, right? He calls it a, a salad-wise mixture, right? So Herman Melville did not at all in his day think he had done anything. He thought he failed, okay? But in his letters to Hawthorne, he says, like, oh, I'm writing the scripture of the age. Oh, that's a great line. You should write that down. He said, I'm writing the scripture of the age. What is he, what's the scripture? What scripture? The Bible, right? He's basically saying, like, this is the new Bible. And he said, I wrote, I've written a wicked book, but I feel spotless as a lamb. Right? So in the midst of composing it, he's excited and thinks something grand is happening. But as I say, in his day, it was regarded as an utter failure. And it's only in the, into the 20th century that the book was kind of discovered. Now, look. What oftentimes happens um, with great works? Yeah, and why is that? Much more modern than its uh, date of um, publication. Do you guys remember when this was published? Did anybody look that up or note? So you should write this down. You should know this. It's very important. 1851, okay? 1851, Moby Dick was published. So that's going to be important, especially when you think about American history, right? American uh, you know, think about, like, this is antebellum period. This is uh, the year of um, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Hello. This is the year of the, uh, the Fugitive Slave Act. You guys aren't there yet, I think. But you've learned enough about it this summer when you read uh, Frederick Douglass's narrative, right? This is a thoroughly um, conflicted America, right? America is, is in the midst of a lot of conflict, and a lot of it has to do with race. Okay, good. All right. Um, I think that's enough by way of intro, Okay. So far, so good? All right, now, let's do this. I only want to say a few things about etymology and extracts. So, look, you can, you can see right away what I'm talking about, right? This is a weird book. What does it start with? It starts, what does etymology basically look like? like, they, um, like, like 
No, no, not an etymology. That's not, that's not right. What, what is etymology? What's that little, open up to it. What is it? What is it a list of? It is a list, but it's not a list of characters. No, 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 it's not about quotes. That's extracts. No, 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 of the word, right? What word? Whale. Like, as if the word whale is so important for us to examine, right? It's like a dictionary, right, it's of some kind, or a, or a foreign language dictionary. And um, he basically shows you um, what the word for whale is in all these different countries, and some quotes about how to say the word whale. And then um, it, that's all prefaced by this weird uh, guy who, um, who's the strange character who seems to have collected all this? This usher, right? This pale, threadbare usher whose business it is to look into dictionaries, right? So that's a very odd way to start a novel, I think, right? Like, we don't know who this person is. There's this collection of words about whales. But one of the things I hope you guys um, see here right in the beginning is that words and whales are immediately connected. Uh, the, just the, even the word for whale is important, okay? So just kind of keep that in your, um, your thinking cap, okay? And let me ask you something. What is implied, I suppose, about such a person? Like, what's his relationship to the whale? If he's hunting up every single word he can find about whales and, and histories of the word, he's obsessed, right? Like, isn't that already? Like, whoever assembled this is obsessed. And then we go to extracts, and we really see an obsession. What kinds of works are included in this? Hold on, listen one more time. What kinds of works are included in extracts? Kind of works. So the Bible is like uh, holy scripture, right? Um, are there, are there uh, plays, songs? Uh, are there histories? Are there, is there science, right? There is, um, there is uh, literature, right? He quotes from, famous li from, from Shakespeare. He quotes from Don... Uh, what's that? Yeah, there's... There's um, also, he includes newspaper articles, right? So the point here, Christian, dial in here, is that uno, the whale is present in every discipline. You, are you following this? From, from music to biology to, uh, you know, travel to sacred texts. One. Do you guys know this word ubiquitous? What does that word mean? Yeah, present everywhere. So on the one hand, in, 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 in literature of all types, the whale is ubiquitous. Okay? The next thing is, um, notice the chronology. Where does the thing begin? Where? Genesis. Where is Genesis? It's in the beginning, right? What's the first line of Genesis? No, the first words, first three words. In the beginning. When are whales? In the beginning. Are you with me? Like, whales appear in the beginning. Yes? And then, of course, if you look at the end of extracts, he's quoting things from, like, the 1850s, from the 1840s. The, the, ship, the, the destruction of the whale ship Essex happened during his, period, his time, right? So when are whales? They're in the beginning and all throughout, right? And... Uh, they're through every discipline, yes, and based on etymology, also where, who has names for whales? Yeah, like all tongues. Are you following this? So there's this really remarkable presence of the whale. It's everywhere, in time, in various texts, in all kinds of disciplines, all over the world. And again, Mikey, what kind of person collects these things from all... What does this imply about this person? What's he been up to? This, this, uh, this in case, is like a sub-sub-librarian. Remember reading this? Like, like, yeah, he's been... What has he been doing at the, at the library? He's been staring through every kind of book looking for whales. Yeah, this is cool. Like, he's been doing what? He's been searching for whales, hasn't he? But Where? Yeah, in, in words. Are you with me? In literature, in books, okay? You with me? Now, the last thing I'll say about these two parts is that um, um, it just underscores, as I said before, the strangeness of the novel. Think about this if you were reading this in the 19th century. This is not the way novels begin, right, with like these dictionaries and collections of quotations. Very odd. And these, 
mention of like these weird, obscure, I don't even know who these people are, this usher and this sub-librarian. I mean, I have a suspicion. You know who I think it is? Well, I mean, who's the best candidate for who this threadbare usher dusting volumes is and the sub sub oh, I mean Ishmael right like in a way don't you think uh, I mean who knows so you can't say but immediately you see like oh there's something kind of strange and odd okay enough you got me all right let's get into chapter one okay uh, unfortunately we have to kind of like book along today because these are big chapters really super important ones and we already read three of them um, plus these other ones plus an intro so we're gonna have to like kind of mosey along today Okay, I'll, and you know, my job primarily is just to kind of help you guys notice things until you've got a little momentum, and then you're going to be noticers yourselves, I'm hoping. All right, so skip down a line, put chapter one, loomings. All right, now, let me say this. Do not neglect titles, okay? Don't neglect titles. Pay attention to the titles. They're oftentimes rather obscure and strange, but if you're a, what kind of reader? An eagle-eyed reader, you'll say to yourself, like, oh, this is interesting. What does this mean? Okay. Now, loomings. What does that word mean? Looming. What's that? Okay, that's good. Um, I don't think that's what he means here, but it's important what Mikey said, that you remember loom is a, an object that you weave on, right? But that's not really what he means here when he says loomings. Is he, he's, uh, he's, it's a noun form of a verb, right? What does it mean to loom? If you say like, oh, this exam is looming. It's like coming over you. It's, yeah, it's, it's almost like a physical quality to looming. It's like bearing down on you. How does it feel? Things that loom, they're unpleasant, right? It's sort of like portentous and nerve-wracking and, and scary in a little bit, like awe-inspiring, right? Um, and it also, when are things that loom? No, no, think, 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 think. Like, if I say, like, something is looming, when is it in time? In the future. In the future, right? You with me? Something that looming is coming. Yes? You with me? So that's the beginning of this chapter. But don't forget what Mikey said, because I think you'll see as we go along, this whole idea of weaving is important. All right, now, so pay attention to the titles, right? This is about things that are arching overhead, over you. And by the way, why don't we just skip right to the end of the chapter, where Ishmael says something very interesting. Go to the very end. You know, he, he says, like, look, I, you know, I went to sea for the following reasons, and, and the last reason he gives is, like, the whale itself drew me, right? And go to the last page, right, of that chapter, okay? And he, he, he compares his head to, like, Noah's Ark, right? He says, like, the, the idea of these whales are going, what, two by two into his head, yes? Mm -hmm. And then what does he say? Read that last line. And then over them all, can somebody read that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Read that sentence. Um, uh, by the reason of these things, then the whaling voyage was welcomed to the great floodgates of the wonder world swung open, and in the wild sea ships flew me to my purpose, to and to there, waded into my inmost soul, endless processions of the whale, and... Okay, stop right there. So, can you picture this? Like, he's sitting at home, like, getting psyched. Where is he, by the way? Where does the story start? Where is he? Chapter 1. No. Okay, uh, next time I ask you, say, like, oh, he's in Manhattan. He mentioned that three times, right? He's in Manhattan, and he's, like, getting psyched at the prospect, and he's sitting there, like, if I were to draw this, like, it would be a big thought balloon, and there would, like, be little pairs of whales going into his head. He's, like, psyched. Are you with me? But then it says, but, go read that last line. Okay. Well, that's weird. And midmost of them all... So amidst them all, there's one, what does it say? A grand hooded phantom. What is it doing? It's like a snow hill. What's the color of a snow hill? White. And where is it? In the air. Something's looming. Are you with me? Right? The end, the image, the final image of the chapter is of something looming. Like a, like a big hill over him. You with me? Um, so... Looming. Pay attention to the titles. What is it that's looming? Well, we'll see. Now, I want to talk about this very first line, which is probably the most famous line, first line in literature, it, certainly of American literature. Call me Ishmael. I want, to, I want to take a minute on that one, okay? So, um, 
if you know somebody comes into a room and says, um, "Hey, uh, call me Johnny," what is what can you infer from that statement? Wait, 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 let's all let's let's not all talk at once. TK, what? Yeah, right. Isn't that, wouldn't you, you'd understand that, like, he has a different name, but this is the name he desires you to use. Isn't that what's kind of implied? Hey, call me Ishmael. So you immediately should say to yourself, like, ah, hmm, that's an interesting thing. Why is he encouraging me to call him in this way? You know, if I were going to film this, I, I, I'd say, this is how I would do it. This is just my interpretation. he would say, like, call me Ishmael. Do you get it or not? Yeah, he made it up on the spot. yeah like this, like it's a choice, right? Like again, now I don't know how well versed you guys are in the Bible. Um, this is going to be very important throughout this novel that you're up on your biblical information. We'll talk about it later. It's not important right now who Ishmael is, but you might want to make a note, like who is Ishmael anyway, like the Ishmael. So just it's not important this moment, but hold that in the back of your head. I also want to encourage you to see the tone. It's very. Um, so if someone, think tone. If I come into a room and say, like, hey, call me Johnny. Like, what is my tone? What, what did you conclude about my, just my demeanor? Friendly. It's friendly, right? Yeah, it's very friendly. It's informal, right? And that's another thing you'll see about Ishmael is that he's kind of warm and spirited, cheerful sort of fellow, right? So you get this from the very first line. A little bit of mystery um, the importance of narr the narrator, right? He's saying, like, look, I'm important. I'm the, f the very first thing you learn about is me. So keep your eyes peeled on this guy, okay? Please. He's, uh, he's somebody you need to, like, be mindful of, okay? So that's the first thing I want you to see. Um, the next thing is he lists, and I think I asked you this on your, on your questions, yes? Like, he lists a bunch of motives, right? He says, listen, you know, a little while ago I, I went to see... Right? And I, I went for the following reasons. And he lists, I don't know, four or five of them. And there's a couple that I want to emphasize. Okay? So the first one, he says, is very interesting. When does he go to sea? When he feels a, what is it, a great line, a drizzly November in his soul. Right? Sad, depressed. And he has all these, he's like, when I find myself like following up funeral processions, when I find myself looking into what kind of shops, or warehouses, remember? Coffin warehouses. It's like, what's on his mind? Death, Death right? Death is on his mind. He's got a, some kind of morbid fixation, yes? He says, that's when I go to sea. And this is interesting. He compares it to what? The pistol and a ball. Now, what's a pistol and a ball for? To shoot, kill, kill yourself. yourself. He says, as Cato, what was it? falls upon his sword, right? I quietly go to sea. Now, what is, why does Cato fall on his sword? To, to kill himself. So this is, a, you should not miss this. What does Ishmael tell you right in the very first page going to sea is for him? Yeah, but don't miss my point. Pistol and a ball. It's his version of a pistol and a ball. It's his version of suicide, right? He doesn't say Instead of killing myself, he says, this is my version, right? Like, the way this guy throws himself on a sword, I go do this thing. You, you following me? So that's, that's a kind of important thing, um, this whole idea of suicide, which will actually come up again in, later in the chapter. Um, so that's one I want you to make sure you do not miss. It's important. Okay, next one, he basically spends a lot of time talking about the thing that draws him to the sea, which is water itself. And this is a really important idea because let me read you a line, and if you're uh, anything but a nitwit, you'll say to yourself, like, oh, I guess that's important. Well, everybody turn with me, if you don't mind, to page uh, three, I think it is. Um, he says the following. Um, this is on, yeah, he's riffing on this whole idea of like how important water is. He says, if you go to Manhattan on any day, where will you find lots of people? What will they be doing? They're just looking at the water. Where is the most expensive real estate always? On the water, On the water right? Um, he says there's something strange here. People are drawn to water. If you are wandering around the woods, you'll end up down by a stream if you follow paths long enough, right? Why do we go to Niagara Falls? 
He says, if it was a cataract of sand, would you go? I mean, obviously, no. There's something about water. Now, turn with me to page two, bottom of the page. He says the following. Why is it almost every robust, healthy boy, it's the very bottom of the page, there must be something to this, he says, that we're all drawn to water, that water is so prominent a part of the human experience, of art, literature. And then he says this incredible thing. He says, and furthermore, there's the story of Narcissus, which he says is a kind of uh, clue. Now, do you guys all remember the story of Narcissus or not? Yeah. Right? What is it? Somebody tell me real quickly. Go ahead. Say it. Okay, this is not helpful. Come on, uh, Luke, you got to speak more plainly. So Narcissus is a lovely young, this is from what? Uh, Greek myth, yes? Yeah. He's a handsome young boy. He passes by a pool and, of water, and what does he see? He sees, uh, he sees another guy, right? And he, what's his reaction? He, he falls in love, right? He falls in love with that other guy. But who is it? It's him, reflected in the water. Now, there's variants of this story. In, uh, I think in Ovid, he turns into a flower. Do you know what a narcissus is? Gardeners? It's a daffodil. It's another name for a daffodil. And it looks like it has a face, and they're oftentimes by a waterside. But other stories, what does, he wa what does he want? He wants to reach out to this image, and what's the result? He falls in and drowns. Mmm. It's just so just, like, look, things are starting to come together already, right? Like uh, the story of Narcissus, he says, ah, this is, look at the next line. When he, he says, what does he say about that story? He says, this is the key to it all. In the water is that ungraspable phantom, right? That, uh, now, now look, Mikey, pay attention. The ungraspable phantom of life, what did you read a second ago? There was a grand, uh, I mean, we don't know what it was, but it was a grand hooded phantom. You guys remember that? And this phantom, he says, is the phantom of life. What is a phantom, by the way? It's a ghost. It's a ghost. And it's obviously, the nature of a ghost is to be ungraspable, right? So, this whole issue of water holding some kind of secret to pay attention to, the story of Narcissus, is going to dominate throughout the story, this idea of like seeing your own image. And of course, if you're an eager reader who's been paying attention for the last weeks, looking into nature and seeing yourself sounds an awful lot like someone. Who? Sing out. Emerson. Emerson, right? Emerson said, like, nature is basically a reflection of your soul. Do you remember this? And here we have a guy who's saying very something interestingly similar, and yet what happens in the end of the story that he tells us? When you grasp that phantom of life. You drowned. Are, are, you, are you with me? You drowned. That's, a, that's not the story Emerson told, right? You become, what do you become in Emerson's version when you get to grasp? You become a, a part and particle of God, right? Whereas in this case, you end up at the bottom of the pool, dead. Very different story. All right, now, I want to highlight, did you guys understand that question I asked you about the fates and the motif he used? First of all, the word motif is going to be very important in this book. It's a very unified book. Things up, uh, come up again and again and again. Like, for instance, here's a quiz question. What is the name of the guy who owns the spouter in? Peter Coffin. What happened in chapter one? He's interested in funerals and coffins, right? So tune in. So, hold on. What was the motif? This is a recurring element um, that he used to talk about fate. Hmm? The mat maker? No, there's no. He mentions that there's this invisible police officer, but there's a little later on, he, he calls them what? Stage managers, and he says they put him down for a part, and he didn't know why he was playing a part in this tragedy when other people got. Uh, roles in farces, and he talked about a program, talked about, um, do you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. So what is he essentially comparing the operations of fate to? A play. a play, theater, right? So hopefully you noted that, right? Again, I'm just highlighting this because in the, this early stage, I want you to see things that might come up again, okay? 
the theater as a kind of stand-in for fate. Now, let me ask you something. In what way, this is real simple, and then we'll go on. In what way is fate or are fate and theater similar? Like, why is it an, an apt kind of metaphor? Okay, R agreed? Mm -hmm. What is going to happen? The outcome is already planned. And what are you doing as a player? You're just acting, acting out a part that was written for you already. Are you with me? And interestingly, Ishmael says, like, oh, one of the reasons I went on this whale journey is because I was given a part and I was acting it out. Now, if you read carefully, what did he say he thought he was doing all along? Yeah, he said, I thought I was acting freely. But as it turns out, now from now this whole story is over, I see a little bit into their methods, yes? Which, by the way, it leads me to the last thing I want to say about chapter one. This is very important. As Hawthorne would, would uh, this is the name of one of Hawthorne's books, Twice Told Tales. This is a twice told tale in this way. Look, when did all this happen? Answer my question. When did Moby Dick happen for Ishmael? In, in the past. In other words, the guy who's talking to you, what does he know about the story? He, he knows the end. Are you with me? He already experienced this. Yes? Now let me ask you something. What does that imply about the way he's going to narrate? Like if you tell a story and you already know the ending, what does that mean? All right, he might give clues. Miles, what would you say? Oh, he might, yeah, similarly, like, like he's already just done, right, with several things, you'll see. Um, he's starting to foreshadow things, because he knows what's coming, you with me? And isn't it also the case, though, I want to just add one thing, that when you know the end of something, you've already experienced something, you see what's important and what's not important, right? Like, for instance, if you were to narrate your day as you go through your day, you might include all sorts of things that in the end don't add up to anything. Whereas if someone said to you, like, hey, how was your day? What are you going to do what are you, when you tell the story? The yeah, you're going to pick up the main important thing. So you need to be thinking about that, too, that this guy already knows the story, so he's choosing the things to tell you. Okay? So make a note of that. All right, we only have about uh, eight minutes left or so. What I want to do is jump into Chapter 3. Okay? And there's just a couple things I want to emphasize about Chapter 3. So one, look, look, can you please tell me, tell me, Tell me, did you find chapter three amusing or not? It was. I mean, did you find yourself chuckling away? Like, I don't know, I think most people think Moby Dick is just like heavy, serious book. But the first thing I think every year people discover is like, that's not true. I thought you told me we were going to 1001. Curses! All right, I want to leave you with one thought. You ready for this? Um, and actually, I'm going to write something up for you guys to, to read because I really want you to like, be able to move forward. So two thoughts on your way out the door. Ready for this? The painting in the Spouter Inn that he looks at for a while, super important. Okay? It's totally irrelevant. It's not important in the story, but it's important for you as a reader. And I'll talk to you more about that. So make a note of that. The painting at the Spouter Inn, yes. Two, I really want you guys to make sure you're not missing the way that Ishmael um, welcomes Queequeg as a friend. Queequeg is a fearful, fearsome looking guy, don't you think? He's tattooed, he's buzzed haired with a top knot, he's a huge cannibal who worships idols and has filed teeth. I mean, this guy is scary looking. And what does Ishmael say at the end of that night? I never slept better before. It's better to sleep with what? A sober cannibal than a drunken Christian, right? That's a really important line. And remember he says this, a man can be honest in any kind of skin. Do you remember this? Now, what's the year? It's 1851. To say such a thing, I mean, what kind of skin does Queequeg have? Dark. It's dark. He's a dark-skinned man. And suddenly we've been told this pagan savage is superior to a Christian obviously a white Christian, right? Which is a rather radical thing to say in 1851. So those are two thoughts I want you to like, we'll pick up on those later. So on your way out, you should pass in two things. Uno, the notes and whatnot that you did for uh, your project this weekend, and dos, 
the um, guided reading questions from the other day. So I'm going to pick up two 